Okay, now you can touch stuff. Now I'm going to go to camera one. You hit camera, whatever you're supposed to there. I need to get back on our computer. All right, and get your computer up, and we should be good. Except I have no computer. Try try hitting your F function, F whatever, and you have it. Technologies class. We are going to do things different in this class because it's about ministry technologies. So you'll notice you don't have a paper syllabus. Your syllabus is actually online. And it's uh, on the screen right now. You can see the web address hopefully, but it's just web.mac.com slash ministry tech. And just lowercase on the minute track. How many of you do not have an, an active internet connection in this classroom? Your computer just won't give you an internet connection. Everybody else has access. Good. Okay. Uh, then go to mac.com or web.mac.com.ministrytech, and we can go over the syllabus real quick. Um, maybe you can look on with someone, Miles, uh, or look on the screen. Um, but just write down that address. Could you say the link again? Web.mac.com slash ministry tech. Mike, did you say that was up there somewhere? Because I don't see it. It's, it's right in this little menu bar right up here. Oh, okay. It's going to be a little hard to see from a distance. But should it be the screen that I'm looking at, actually, uh, what you should get? is um, this one. Course information, you'll notice there's three uh, sections to it, and I have to remember not to drift around. I tend to walk around, and uh, I'm not supposed to do that since we're recording. But you have course information, you have assignments, and then there's a blog. We'll talk about that as time goes on. But just let's look at this course information more quickly. Uh, the course description, this course is a study of technologies that can be utilized in ministry. Emphasis will be placed on leveraging skills to assist in Bible study, sermon preparation, outreach, and communication. Um, so basically, we're just going to talk about things that you can do in ministry to help the congregation grow. Topics that we're going to discuss are electronic Bible study and research tools and methods. That's actually going to be the first major section that we're going to cover. We're going to talk about using PowerPoint effectively. PowerPoint is becoming more and more popular. How many of you have preached with PowerPoint already? Okay. Uh, a couple of you. Uh, how many of you have attempted to preach with PowerPoint already? Okay, a couple of you. Uh, we're going to talk about congregational websites, why you should have one, what its purpose should be. Uh, there are different schools of thought on that. We're going to talk about blogging for ministry. Uh, so we'll look at that as well. 
podcast audio delivery. Uh, podcasting is a relatively new way of, of sending audio files across the net. Are we having a problem? Okay. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about permission evangelism. I talked to you about permission evangelism uh, in personal evangelism class. For those of you that haven't had PE this year, um, we'll talk about it again a little bit. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but I want to kind of refresh some of the concepts from using digital technology for evangelism purposes. What, what, what are the course objectives? Well, basically, to teach students advanced techniques for Bible study and research using Libronic software. How many of you do not have your Libronic software? Okay, so not as many as I thought. Basically, this is going to be a lab kind of class. Uh, and I realize this is really small on screen. We'll, most things will be larger. Um, but... Um, See if I can actually make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, it's not going to let me. Um, we're going to actually do things on screen. I'm going to show you ways to run certain reports, do particular things, and you know I'm going to want you to do it in class so that you get used to it. Now, there's a kind of a two-edged sword to that. One is you're spending so much time focusing on doing what I've done that a week from now you may not remember how to do what I showed you how to do. So uh, I would strongly advise that you take notes, either on a piece of paper, if that's easier, since you'll be using your computer primarily for logo. Um, but jot down little clues that are going to help you remember how to do some of these techniques. Uh, some of them are pretty simple. I, there's, there's some debate as to how user-friendly uh, Libronics is, in most areas, it's very friendly. In a couple of areas, it's not. As you dig deeper into the software, because you're doing such more elaborate things, it can get more confusing. So it's kind of you wade in up to your ankles at first, and then up to your knees, and then up to your hips, and then up to your chest. So uh, we'll, we'll take it slow, and we'll, we'll try to go through there. I'll also go very slowly, um, and we'll see how we can do it. The second objective is to teach students visual communication skills and techniques using PowerPoint to help in sermon delivery and Bible class teaching. You know, one of the problems is a lot of preachers jump into using PowerPoint, but they don't understand visual communication. They've been taught how to do verbal communication, but they've really not been taught anything about color or how to put stuff up on the screen or what shapes work well and that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk about those things. We need to teach students the benefits and techniques for using websites and blogging in their ministry. We'll cover some of that. Teach students technology concepts, tools, and techniques for outreach and edification. So that's our part. Our course design is part one. The first major, major section uh, of this course will deal with using the Logos Bible software. We're going to spend close to, if not a little over half of this quarter, using Logos. So um, it, it, I mean, come with your computer on and ready to go. Because of that, make sure that you're here on time with your computer booted up and ready to rock and roll. Uh, Libronics on some of your machines may run slower than others. Uh, if we get here and you have to boot up your machine, then boot up Libronics and try to catch up. It may be hard for you to get at the beginning of class. So do your best to be here on time. We're going to deal with a number of tools and techniques to really enhance your personal Bible study, especially with a focus on doing some of the things that Denny talked about in exegesis class earlier today. Uh, some of you are in exegesis. Some of you have already had exegesis. Uh, some of you won't get it for a while based on schedule. Uh, but my approach here is going to be to try to help uh, leverage what you're learning in exegesis class with this tool. Okay, so we'll talk more about that. Part two, the second major section of the course will deal with specific technologies for ministry. We'll cover website development, preaching, with PowerPoint, blogging, ministry, uh, electronic evangelism, and that kind of stuff. You'll also notice on the right side of the screen I have a number of links to things, and I'll add more links as time goes on. Um, but we'll talk about these links when we get there. There's places for books, and there'll be downloadable files and that kind of stuff. In the assignment section... One of your major assignments is to do a ministry blog, okay? 
How many of you have done any form of blogging now? Okay, uh, so a few of you. Most of the time, it's through things like Facebook, MySpace, that kind of stuff. I want you to use a product called Blogger. Uh, it's, there's a link here on, in the syllabus to Blogger, uh, and I want everybody to set up a Blogger blog. Okay, It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes to get one set up. It doesn't take very long. But what I want you to do is I want you to think about this as a ministry tool. Now, I realize some of you don't have ministries. You're in school. Uh, maybe it's a missionary effort. Maybe if, if mission work is what you're going to do long term, maybe use this blog as a way to communicate with people back home. Okay? If you plan to do youth ministry, focus, focus it on uh, being a youth ministry site. Uh, if you just want to, if you think you're going to be a preacher or something along those lines, then just use it for ministry-related kinds of communication. Think of this as an electronic bulletin article that I want you to write, okay, and I want you to post to. We'll talk more in depth about how blogging can help your ministry down the road, but I want you to think of this assignment as a real-world practical assignment. You only need nine entries uh, between now and the end of the quarter. Uh, these entries need to throughout the quarter, not all at once. Each entry must be at least 24 hours apart. The reason I have that rule is because I don't want you to wait till the Thursday before the end of the quarter and post nine little paragraphs and say, see, I did it. Part of blogging is getting used to doing something on a regular basis. Get your readers used to seeing your material on a regular interval. Now, some people blog two or three times a day. Other people blog once a week, once a month, whatever the case may be. But I want you to get into the habit of doing it on a regular basis. At least three of these entries must be 150 words or more. okay? And at least two of the entries must include an image of some kind, just a photograph or something uh, taken with a digital camera and posted to your blog. Photos make, tend to make your text a little bit more interesting to look at. I don't know how many of you get the daily bread from Neil, our preacher here. Do any of you? Uh, get the daily bread. You'll notice he puts a photograph at the top with some little description of the photograph. Well, why does he do that? Because getting just another page of text in your email is kind of dull. It's like, okay, here's something else I have to read. But when you see the picture, it's like, ooh, I want, what's that picture about? And it draws you in. So I want you to use at least a couple of photographs throughout. The final entry must be posted no later than January 28th. Okay, and you need to email me, and you can use this link to do it. But email me with the URL of your website, your blog, by Monday, December third. Okay, all you have to do is send me an email that says this is the name of my blog. Now it's going to be whatever you call your blog. Dot blogspot. Dot com is going to be the address. Yeah. What if we already have the blog itself? I want you to do a blogger blog. If you're using Facebook or, or MySpace and that kind of stuff, that's great. You can keep doing that. I want everybody to do a blogger blog for this class. So you need to create a new one. If you have a blogger site, as long as you can focus it on ministry-related material, uh, I'll accept that. But I do want everybody to use the same tool. First of all, it's easy to use. It's probably one of the easiest ones out there. So if you're not familiar with doing this kind of stuff, uh, it'll, it'll be easy to adapt to. Any questions about the ministry blog? Okay. The second assignment is a minor research paper. It's 25% of your, your grade, but I want you to write a research paper between five and seven pages in MLA form with a minimum of four different sources. And the general theme is the use of technology in ministry or the potential use of technology in ministry. It's okay to say these are things that could be done that maybe aren't being done. Um, but I want you to pick one of the following areas to focus on. Uh, preaching, worship, evangelism and outreach, teaching and Bible education, congregational communication, membership management, and youth ministry. And write your five-page paper on one of those topics. The use of technology in preaching, the use of, use of technology in worship, the use of technology in teaching and Bible education. Okay? Uh, pretty straightforward stuff. The due date for that is January 11th. It's a Friday. 
your required reading, you have a, a required text, and that is this book called Wired for Ministry by John P. Jewell. Uh, I have set out sections that I want you to read by particular dates, uh, and some of this material will be on the final exam. So when you read through this book, it's an easy read, first of all. It, it's not very elaborate. Uh, his vocabulary is, is pretty simple to straightforward. But I want you to study the book, not just read it. And I'll give you some research questions and stuff as we go through things that I won't kind of clue in on. Uh, but stay up to date with your reading on, in that book. Did These books did come in, did they not? Yeah. Okay. Um, you will have a midterm exam and a final exam. Your midterm exam is a skills-based exam. It will. I don't have a date for it yet. It will come right after we're finished with the logo section. But I won't be asking you fill in the blank kind of answers. I'm going to be asking you ministry related questions that you're going to have to use your software to find answers to. But I tell you right there, there's going to be no studying for the answers to the midterm test. You won't be able to. But I'm going to ask you things like how many times does the word agape show up in the fourth chapter of John? Um, and it should only take you a few seconds to find that answer if you know what tools to use in Libronics to do that. And we're going to cover all this material, but that's how I want you to approach this lab kind of kind of stuff. Be thinking of how this actually functions in a day-to-day -day environment. When I'm studying a particular text, what tools am I using? Am I running exegetical guides? Am I running passage guides? Uh, am I doing an Englishman's concordance? What, what tools am I using to ferret out this information because you will actually have an open computer, open note, midterm. You'll be able to use your software to find these answers. You will have to use your software to find these answers. Uh, so it's a little different kind of test than you're used to. Uh, and I strongly recommend that you check this website uh, where your assignments are posted, especially the blog section, uh, probably a week or two before midterm because I usually post information that will be very, very helpful to you in passing the midterm. So if you stay up with the blog, uh, you should have a lot of hints on what tools to familiarize yourself with, uh, what to go back and look at. So, And then the final exam will be Thursday, January uh, 31st, the end of the quarter. The blog site, I've already posted a couple of things for you to look at. Um, there's a couple of entries. One is using smart tags for Microsoft Word, which is a, a great trick if you are a PC user. Uh, there is a little program that you can download that will enhance your Microsoft Word and integrate it with Logos, and you can read up on that uh, and just to get you familiar with where this blog is. Uh, I will post information on this blog from time to time, and you can look there uh, and get more information as time goes along. Any questions about the general assignments and the structure of the class? I need to not drift. Yes? Would you need the PowerPoint? No, um, you don't have an assignment in building PowerPoint. It may be helpful when we get to the PowerPoint section if you do have it, but it's not a requirement. Uh, I'm going to be showing you how to do some things in PowerPoint, uh, mostly from a slide structure basis. Why do you use certain colors? Why do you use certain kinds of typefaces, that kind of thing? But you're not going to have to, to follow along, you know, place by place. So if you have it, you might find it helpful, but it's not required. Any other questions, comments? What date did you have for the midterm exam? Uh, I don't have a date for the midterm because it will depend on when we finish uh, the logo section. And I, one of the things about this logo section that I think is going to be really important is it, I want to go slow enough that you guys are getting it and, and understanding how to use these tools, but I also can't take the entire quarter just to go over how to run a vocabulary list, okay? So I, I need you uh, to focus and pay attention, uh, and we'll just take our time and see how long it goes. Right now it's scheduled for about 24 classroom hours just for the Logos stuff, uh, and I think you'll find that very practical. We're going to go very deep in what you can do with the software, 
Uh, but that means that we've got to take some time and we've got to go a little slower. So I don't have a date for the midterm yet. Other questions, comments? Okay. So the next question becomes, you know, why are we here? I mean, why are we using uh, this kind of technology? What, why, why study this particular topic? And basically there's three major reasons. First is to enhance your own personal study. It's very interesting. Um, sermon and Bible class preparation, first and foremost. As preachers, and you've got a couple here, you know, that are sitting in on class, your time as a, as a minister is tight. Would you say that's uh, an effective description, Rick? You have typically, now for smaller congregations, you have probably at least one Bible class a week, probably two, maybe three, depending on how small the congregation is, you have to put together. You have a Sunday morning sermon and you have a Sunday evening sermon. Uh, so even if it's just one Bible class and two sermons, how much time does it take you to put together a sermon? I, I mean, one of the problems I think we have is that more preachers are spending more time putting their sermons together. Oh, I can, you know, I had a, a former student tell me one time, you know, give me a, a good Bible dictionary and a concordance in about an hour and a half and I can come up with a sermon. Well, more power to you, but... You know, I can't imagine that the depth of those sermons is going to help your congregation to grow much. It takes time. Now, you add PowerPoint into the mix. It's not just about putting your sermon outline together. Now you have to put your PowerPoint together. Denny, how long does it take you to put together a PowerPoint now? Uh, still a couple of hours. At how much did it take when you first started? Uh, six to ten. Yeah. What most people don't realize is that to do PowerPoint correctly, to do it well, when you're first starting, it's going to take you five, six, seven hours just to do your PowerPoint, let alone everything else. Now, with time and practice, it gets down to the point where it's two or three hours, but it's never just a, oh, yeah, I need to throw my PowerPoint together real fast for service on Sunday. It takes time. Now, what have we forgotten that you still have to do? Visiting members, counseling, doing personal Bible studies, going to the hospital, conducting funerals, doing marriage counseling, preaching at a wedding. I mean, you've got a thousand other things that are going on. And you got to recognize that it's all about balance. Technology, I, I'm hoping I'm to show you that technology in this class is going to help you have a more effective use of the time that you have available. The problem becomes if you spend too much time studying, you may have great lessons, but they're going to miss the mark. You're not going to know your people. And so they may be these wonderful exegetical lessons that the people that are sitting in the pews can't relate to, or they're just going to be over their heads because you're going to spend all this time delving into the Greek and you're going to preach about all these Greek words and all these tenses and how everything, and they're just going to glass over and go, what on earth are you talking about? You have to spend time with people. The opposite is also true. If you spend too much time with people, then your sermons are going to tend to be flat and shallow. There's not going to be a lot of meat in there. And so striking a balance is, is an important thing. There's, there's an entire group of folks, older members of your congregations are going to see these newfangled computers and things that you have on your desk, and they're going to say, oh, they just, they just must be playing games or something on that thing. I mean, they don't, they don't understand the technology. And I've already been told by at least three people to warn you when I do this class that this is not licensed for you to sit in your office all day and play with your computer. Well, that's kind of like saying you shouldn't sit in your office all day and study from books because that's really what I want you to be thinking about. Now, if you have a pension to sit and play games on your computer, you're going to have a hard time being a preacher. I'm telling you right now because what's going to happen is you're going to get overwhelmed at times 
with everything that you have to do. So what I, well, I'll just play a quick game of solitaire and get my head together. And next thing you know, you've burned two and a half hours sitting at your computer doing nothing, and you still have the visiting to do, and you still have the studying to do, and you still have the Bible class to put together, and you still have everything else that was on your plate. So, you know, part of preaching is, is being a good self-starter and a good manager of your time. And so we're going to talk a lot about how this technology can help you go deeper faster. And that's really the important part. I have some books there. I kind of want to uh, give you an example of this whole idea of going deeper faster. First of all, what's a concordance? Who can tell me what a concordance is? I guess that's uh, you can use that to find passages of uh, maybe a verse that you know of that will help you find that verse. Okay. Let's say for just a second that you're studying John 3.16. It's a pretty familiar passage, but you're going to use it as a major passage in your preaching on Sunday. And so you want to look at some word studies and that kind of stuff. And you've hit this word world. And you just want to see more about the word world, okay? Now, with traditional books, you would grab a concordance, and what would you hope to find in that concordance? The word, first of all. But why would you? What, what else would you find? Where that word is found throughout the Bible. Right. It's going to show you all of the places where that particular word occurs. It may tell you the Greek word. Now, if you're studying in John and you want to find out more about the, the word world, I can show you real quick. I can just do a thing called an exegetical guide. No, that, that's not it. What I can do is, since I'm in John 3.16 in my Libronics, I can just run an exegetical guide real quickly. And what it's doing is taking every Greek word in that passage and breaking it out for me. Now, I wonder how many times the word world occurs in the New Testament. I mean, that's one of the things that you would try to get out of your concordance, right? So you're going to go to your shelf, you're going to pull the book off the shelf, and you're going to look up the word world. Well, by the time you've done that, I'm able to tell you that the word world occurs 186 times in the New Testament. Now, you could figure that out, but how much faster was it for me to just run the simple report? The next thing I can do is I can actually tell you exactly where it occurs within that 186 times. Notice this, 78 times it appears in the Gospel of John. That's that longest bar there. Where else is it used in the, in the New Testament pretty significantly? Well, you see 1 Corinthians has 21 occurrences and you have 1 John has 23 occurrences. So if I'm studying the, the word world, where am I going to go? Am I going to start at Matthew? Now, if I look at that concordance, I can't readily figure out necessarily all of these places. How about what chapter? You know, I really want to know if there's a particular chapter uh, within these books where it, where it occurs significantly. So I just scroll down here. Whoa. I got 18 occurrences in John chapter 17. Do that from your paper concordance. And do, do that fast. Danny, you're a word study guy. And I know that you guys are going to learn in, in exegesis class how important words are. And, and doing word counts and figuring out where words are and how many times they occur. Do you think in John chapter 17 the word word, world, is significant? 18 times, how many, how many verses are there in John chapter 17, 20, 23, I think, 21, uh, somewhere around there. It might be 24. But you've got 18 occurrences in somewhere around 20 verses. You think that would be a place to really start to delve into that particular word? So you see how quick you can do that? You cannot do that from paper books. You could look it up in a concordance, but figuring out which chapters it occurs most frequently, how things would go now, I've, I need to know what the Greek word is. 
Well, you'll notice that it's just right here. It's listed right in this exegetical report. And I'm going to show you how to run these reports. I just, I'm just trying to show you how quickly you can get to a number of these resources. You probably won't be able to hear this very well, but I can click on this little button. Cosmos. And it pronounces the Greek word for me. So it tells me how to pronounce it. It's right here. It's Cosmos. But I want to know more about Cosmos. I didn't know that the word was Cosmos when I started this study 30 seconds ago. But now I can maybe look it up in Art and Gingrich. Well, there it is in Art and Gingrich. That serves to beautify the decoration. Orderly arrangement, order, the world, the universe. This is all here for me to study. Just one click away. Now, even if I had my concordance, how much longer is it going to take me? I've got Art and Gingrich here. How long is it going to take you to look up Cosmos? How many of you know your Greek alphabet? Let's see, it's a, it looks like a K, but I mean, it may take you 15 minutes just to find it in here. As you all found out in uh, class last quarter, Looking up some of the things without a page number is difficult if you don't know Greek. Well, I can tell you that in the third edition of Art and Gingrich, and you can see it right here, it's on page 561 of the third edition of Art and Gingrich. And if I open Art and Gingrich to page 561, I'm going to find the word study on Cosmos. That is why Libronics is so much superior to pretty much every other Bible software on the market. And I'm going to sound like a sales guy for Libronics. But what I like is the fact that it's all citable sources. I mean, you can cite this word study to the print book of Art and Gingrich. And anybody out there that has the third edition print version of Art and Gingrich can turn to that page and find your exact quote or your resource. And most, not all, but a significant number of the resources in Libronics work that way. You can look up the page. TNT, Art Gingrich, Oxfords, all of those are indexed page for page the same way the print versions are. So it makes it very easy. Uh, if I want to look it up in TDNT, I click one button. It's on page 457 in the abridged version of, of TDNT, the little, little kittle. Remember, we talked about that a little bit in uh, language and research. So here's the whole word study on Cosmos in Little Kittle from one click away. I didn't have to get up and go across the room. I didn't have to look up which volume it was in. It's all just right there. This software, this approach to studying, over the course of your ministry, will save you literally hundreds of hours. I'm fully convinced of that. Just little things like this. We haven't done anything but run one report about a passage that we were looking at. And so all we did was run one simple report. And yet, look at the amount of study that we're able to do. Look at what we're able to look at just by running a simple exegetical guide. Okay? You know, the Greek word... We even know it's even parsed it for us. In this particular version, in this particular verse, it's an accusative noun. Well, I forget what accusative means. Well, hover over it. It's the case that normally marks the direct object of a verb. So all of those little Greek helps are built right in as well. So it becomes very powerful very quickly. Now, I have a serious question to ask, and that is, how hard is it to see this screen? It's very hard. Okay. We're going to have to see what I can do to make my screen larger so that it looks up, looks in, like it's in bigger type. Um, but do you see the advantage to time? It's going to allow you to dig deeper in your studies faster. You're going to be able to run reports that are going to get you to resources so much more quickly that you're going to be able to maximize your study time and you're going to be able to maximize the time that you spend with your members, the time that you spend visiting and that kind of stuff. It's about bang for your buck. It's about 
managing your time to the point where every minute that you spend in study is valuable. So how can I make the most of it? Because you're going to find, and I think Rick will, will attest to this, Denny will too, from the days that he did full-time ministry, uh, and even what we do now. You're going to get pulled in 50 different directions all at the same time. And guess what? Come Sunday morning, they still want this out of the park home run Bible class because you're the preacher. You're supposed to know all this stuff. There's this impression that you really don't have to put a lesson together. You just grab your Bible and go to Bible class and teach, right? I mean, isn't that kind of, it's, it's sad, but I, I mean, you're going to have members that think you don't have to do any study at all. You just get up there and, you know, it just comes flowing out of your mouth. The reality is, is it's a lot of hard work, and you're going to have to spend time and study. <clears throat> One of the myths that I want to, maybe a couple of the myths that I want to kind of extinguish right off the bat, is that the software does everything for you. Uh, Denny talked in Exegesis class this morning about being a workman, about the idea that it takes a lot of effort to be an exegete, and it does. And I'm hopeful that I'm going to show you tools that are going to help you be a better workman. But you still have to do the work of an exegete. It's not going to, there's no button on your keyboard that says, tell me what this means. There's no button on your keyboard that says, show me the context of this passage. I mean, you still have to do your legwork. You still have to be familiar with the text. You have to look at the words. You have to decide how they fit together and how they apply. This tool is going to allow you to break that all down. I mean, I can tell you the grammatical parsing of every word in the New Testament that fast. But so what? I mean, do you really care if it's an accusative noun? What? How does that matter? How does that change the meaning of the word in the passage? Or does it? And those are all things that you have to know. So first of all, it doesn't do the work for you. You still have to do a lot of work. Okay? Secondly, is that it, it's, it's not some silver bullet. If you don't have good study skills, if you aren't motivated to sit down with your Bible open, most likely you're not going to be motivated to sit down with this software open. It's not a video game. It's not, I mean, I think it's fun, but I'm, I'm kind of twisted. I sit at home and run reports and guides to see how I can find things in the text. But if, if you don't have the determination to sit down and study your Bible, you're probably not going to have the determination to sit down and use this. So you need to work through those things. I mean, you need to get to the point where you're hungry for the Word and you're trying to dig. And finally, the, the third minute I really want to try to kill is that you don't need to know Greek in order to do any of this. <clears throat> now, Denny's not going to like me and Will's not going to like me, but I need to say it anyway. Libronics... <laughs> yeah, la, 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 la. <laughs> Libronics is going to help you know more Greek than you know. But if you don't understand the basic tenets of Greek, you're not going to know what to search for or how to search for it. I mean, the idea of finding a string of participles that follow an imperative, if you don't even understand what that's all about, you're not going to know how to have Libronics tell you where those occur. So don't be going to Will's Greek class tomorrow saying, Mike's teaching us Libronics, so I don't need to know vocabulary. I can just click on this, and it tells me what all the parsing is. That's true to an extent, but you will be able to go so much deeper, so much faster, if you understand the structure and construction in Greek, okay? Especially when we get to morphological searches and syntactical searches. Uh, when you start to try to look for a particular type of verb or a particular sentence structure, if you don't understand how the Greek is constructed, you won't know how to do those searches. So... Again, you do not have to be a Greek scholar, uh, as Denny so politely mentioned in his exegesis class, pointed out that I am not a Greek scholar. Um, I thought that was a little bit of a dig, but that's okay. Um, but he's right. I, I look at the Greek text in very much in detail when I'm studying for a Bible class or for a sermon. 
And I can do that with Libronics. I wish I knew more Greek. And Libronics is helping me learn more Greek. Uh, you can use this tool to help you dig deeper and to learn those things. But don't just, don't just turn over your knowledge of Scripture to the software. You still have to do the work. One of the things Danny also mentioned in class, and I agree with him completely, and it's one of the reasons why in LNR I didn't talk about it too much. You'll notice that when we went through, we spent, what, six weeks in the library? How many commentaries did I point you to? None. Because they are a crutch. And they get to the point where, okay, well, I need to know what Rick believes this passage means. Well, just call Rick if that's the only thing that you want to know is what Rick thinks the passage means. You need to get to the point where you understand and you believe the passage to mean. Then you can use commentaries to either confirm or, or challenge your conclusion if, if you want to. Uh, but Libronics is full of commentaries. There's tons of commentaries for you to look at. But it's kind of the easy way out. And you're reinforcing this idea that there are certain people out there that have studied it all, and I don't really need to study it. I'll just ask Denny. Uh, you know, and how many times a week, Denny, do you get a phone call that's kind of that very nature? I haven't studied this yet, but you tell me what it means. I've got a class on Sunday. Well, folks, if that's going to be your mindset, turn the computer off. And as Denny said, maybe McDonald's might be a good career, but preaching isn't going to be it, okay? Now, that said, there are a tremendous number of resources available to you through this software that you can and should use. Uh, you also need to check with Will in Greek class as to what tools he will allow you to use in class and not in class to do homework and vocab and all of those kinds of things. My guess is he's going to say the computers don't go into the classroom. Uh, I think that's the rule, is it not? Okay. Uh, and if he doesn't allow you to reduce the computers in the classroom, guess where else he doesn't want you to use them? At home while you're doing your homework in Greek class. So uh, spend the time to learn the Greek. It will help you uh, be more effective with this software. Any questions so far? <clears throat> okay. I want everybody to start Libronics. If it's not running already, we'll hear lots of wonderful little musical chimes and that kind of thing. Like I said, if, um, if you don't have it yet or if you struggle with your computer, it might be best just to take some good notes, some detailed notes. Uh, but I want to start initially with this home page. Can everybody see that for the most part? Okay. Um, the first thing... If anybody is not at the home page, there's an icon up here on your toolbar. It looks like a little house with an arrow and a piece of paper up behind it, but it's, it's right up here in your toolbar. And if you hover over it for a second, it'll say close all and open home. If you have any other windows in Libronics open, click that button and cl let it close everything and open your home page. I just want to go with the home page. We're going to start here. Uh, and we're going to go through this, and I'm going to show you how to get started. How many of you, since most of you have the software, how many of you have been using it? Okay. Um, what we're going to start with is we're going to kind of start with Logos on Autopilot. Those things that, that are built in to make it real easy to get the information quickly, uh, to, to start your study fast, rather than digging deeper. Eventually, I'm going to show you how to build workspaces that you customize with those books and tools that you use on a regular basis all the time, and how to build those workspaces, and how to start logos into those workspaces for your study. But we're going to start just with the home page. So everybody should be just at the home page, okay? Now, one of the first things that you need to do is click on this custom, customized view in the upper right hand corner of that window, and you should see uh, this screen. It should start out with things like latest news and little check boxes, Bible study starter. Choose preferred Bible and commentary. This is where you tell Logos what your main study Bible is. 
Now, how many of you are New King James guys? Okay. Only a couple. Um, I want you to set your Bible to the NAS 95 update. I will explain why later. I... I, I know that some of you are, are strong new King James folks, but I want you to set, for now, I, I want you to set your Bible to your New American Standard Bible. When you click on this list, you're going to see a huge list of Bibles that are available. And the NAS is standard Bible in this uh, set, no matter what you purchased. And so you should have the New American Standard 95 uh, update. As far as your Bible commentary, I don't care what commentary you select. Again, I'm not huge on commentary. Uh, pick whichever one comes up in your list. The, all of the B ones that are, you know, be amazed, be authentic, be available, don't pick one of those. Um, but pick, uh, pick one of the others that shows up there in your list. One of the things that you're going to notice is that I have different books than you do. Um, I've been using this software now for six years, seven years, and I have probably over 2,000 books in my library. So I have a few more books than you do, so it won't be unusual when I plug a list for mine to be really long and yours to only be seven or eight or ten or fifteen books, but uh, just select a commentary. The other, the other checkbox on this screen that's really, really important is right underneath where it says Passage Study. It says show study options. Make sure that that is clicked on. You should have a checkbox in show study options. And I'll show you what that does in just a minute. But these checkboxes allow you to customize the home page. Uh, for right now, if you have selected, um, let's see, I'm going to turn on some other ones that you will have turned on just so that we'll be looking at the same thing. Okay. As long as you have a Bible selected and a commentary selected and show study options, go up to the upper right-hand corner and say Save Changes, and you'll just go back to your home page. <clears throat> your home page is kind of the place to start, and it has lots of cool little features uh, before you start to do your Bible study that are interesting. The first one that you'll notice is this latest news. If you click the little arrows next to the titles, each one of these sections expands and contracts. And what the Logos News does is it goes to the news uh, website at Libronics, at Logos, and pulls up information that they have put out as news. Now, I'll tell you, latest news is typically books that are becoming available. That's what this section is usually about. Libronics Logos has an interesting thing, and it's, they put books on pre-publication. Uh, and you need to know about this because it is pretty cool. What they do is they, they decide whether or not a book uh, has an audience by putting it out on pre-publication and seeing who's willing to order it. Uh, you go to the website, you follow these links, go to the website if it's something that you decide that you want. You can order it before it's even published, and they get a sense of whether or not it's going to be worth their time to publish it. The advantage to you is that you get a cheap price, compared to the final publication price. Uh, for example, when they were doing the Oxford Dictionary, which is about a $125 book, I got it for $65 because I was one of the first ones to click on it and say, I don't care if it takes you five years to publish it, I'll buy it when you've got it. Well, I locked my price in at like $64.95. Well, retail on it's $125 or something. So pre-publication, if it's a book that you know that you'll use, can be valuable. It kind of gets to be a pain just because Logos has so many books about available. You have literally thousands of books that you can add to your electronic library, which is really awesome. You know, when you start to really get a grasp of what you're doing with this electronic library, and we're going to talk about the benefits of electronic libraries as you go through, it's really amazing. When I went to Tanzania last year, uh, two years ago actually, I was teaching James and First and Second Peter and Jude. Well, I had my entire library with me on the airplane. I'm looking up stuff in TDNT and the Oxford Dictionary and Art and Gingrich. And I mean, you guys have seen these books. You know, they're like this thick. You can't carry one of them in your carry-on bag, let alone you know ten volumes of TDNT and 
Oxford Dictionary and everything else, and I'm, I'm on the plane doing research. Uh, I'm in the middle of Africa, and as long as I still have battery power, I have my entire library with me. It's a very powerful tool to have with you. Now, the one downside is that you can't take the traditional preacher photo with your, life, you know, your shelves of books behind you to put in the bulletin that, you know, here's our preacher and look at his library. You'd have to kind of do the, you know, this kind of thing, I guess. <laughs> um, but it's, it's cool that you have so many things that are just right here with you wherever you go. Uh, so don't just blow off the, the pre-pub kind of stuff, though. I mean, look at them. Uh, see what comes available. Every now and then there's one that I go, wow, I didn't know they were going to do that one. And so it's, it's worth following up on. A lot of them you may never heard of. But you can also turn these off. If I don't want to see the latest news on my home page, well, go back to Customize View, uncheck the little box next to Latest News, save my changes, and now my home page doesn't start with Latest News. It's out of my way. I don't have to look at it anymore. And you can do that with any of these sections. Now, don't turn off Bible Study Starter because that's where you're going to do most of your work. But all of these others you have choices with. We're going to skip the Bible study starter for a second because I want to just go through what else is on your homepage. Quick launch is a, uh, it's kind of like your bookmarks on in your web browser. It's just links to recent workspaces and documents that you've opened. For example, I did a verse list the other day on Parakaleo, and if I click on it, <coughs> There's my verse list on, that I put together on Parakaleo. I was, I was studying that particular word, and I put a verse list together of all the occurrences of Parakaleo, and so I saved it as a verse list. And now I don't have to do all that research to find it. I just click on it and open it. Now, there's other ways to open that document, but uh, for right now, that's what Quick Launch does. It gets you to those, um, those documents more quickly. Lectionary is a way that denominational folks use their particular lectionaries uh, to do uh, devotionals and those kinds of things. Feel free to turn that one off. I don't usually have it on. Uh, it's in my way, and we have particular views on that kind of stuff anyway. So you can just go back to Customize View, click off your lectionary, Save your changes at the top of that window, and it won't bother you anymore. So customize this home page the way you want. Devotionals actually are pretty interesting. Uh, there are a number of different devotionals that are available. Some of them you may have heard of before. This one, the one that I've got turned on just to have one so I could show you, is the 365-day devotional commentary. You'll notice that it opened to today. Okay, This is a daily devotional kind of thing. Now, go up to Customize View and scroll down in your list until you get to that daily devotional. And you'll notice all of these books, these are all daily devotional books that you have. I have in my library. You probably have two or three. Uh, the one that most likely you have is My Utmost for His Highest. That's one that people have heard of before. Um, Morning and Evening is another one that's relatively common. Uh, and you can put, turn the checkboxes on on those and then just scroll up to the top of that page, save changes. And now in my devotional section, I've got November 27th from My Utmost for His Highest and Morning and Evening. So it's just a little devotional thought for the day. It's kind of those little, like those little calendars that people have on their desks and that kind of stuff with a little Bible passage and kind of a thought for the day. Not really a bad deal. Um, again, most of it's denominational in thought, but uh, sometimes they can be helpful. The next one is prayers. Uh, and this is, this is an interesting section. First of all, it lists books in your library on prayer. So if you want to study prayer, there. but you can also create prayer lists. Uh, and I do find this very interesting. If you're like most people, you struggle in some aspects of your prayer life. Uh, a lot of folks do. And so sometimes just learning to write down your prayers, excuse me, the things that you want to pray about, 
can be very helpful. And Logos can help keep track of that. You can click on New Prayer List. And basically, it's going to give you an interface where you can say, I've got a new prayer, and the name of the prayer is Pray for... Like type. Pray for Rick. And you can put notes in about what the prayer is for, the status is active, you can give them different categories, you can have a start date and an end date. I want to pray for the next week about patience. Okay, so I can just type in the name of the prayer is patience. I've got my little note. I want to pray for the next week on that. So I'm going to put this through, let's say through December 1st. And I'm going to say OK. Now when I close this window, it's going to ask me, do I want to save the document or do I want to leave the document unnamed or do I want to delete it? I'm just going to put Mike's prayers. Say OK. Now you'll notice that in my prayer list on my home page, I have a reminder to pray for patience. And if I hover over it, it shows me the little note that I just typed. So I can be very detailed as far as what I want to say about that in my prayer. When I do my prayer, I can just click it and it'll disappear. Now tomorrow, when I relaunch, it's going to remind me to pray for patience again because I told it to do it every day for a week. So that's kind of a great little reminder. If something's troubling you, if you can get in the habit of using this as a tool to do that, you know, I've read statistics or at least I've heard statistics Somewhere in the neighborhood of 90% of the people that say they will pray for you don't. <laughs> you know, it's always, oh, I know you've been struggling. I'll, I'll pray f- for you. Well, they don't. Now, is it, they, they're just mean and nasty and don't want to pray for you. No. They just forget, right? I mean, by the time you shake hands at Sunday morning worship and tell 10 people you'll pray for them, unless you get in the habit of writing that down, there's a good chance that you're going to forget it. So... This is one way, one tool that you could use to maybe keep a little notepad in your pocket, but then write those things down, type it into your computer, and then each day when you go to do at least one of your prayer sessions, check the list and have a reminder of the things that you want to pray about. Questions about prayer lists? Now, the cool thing is when you do uh, prayer lists, you can uh, – actually, I just opened a new prayer list. You can actually put down – when a particular prayer has been answered. You'll notice you, it's got a space for, you know, was the prayer answered? Um, if I click on it was answered, I can put a note in as to how it was answered or how I believe it was answered uh, and, and record that as well. So it, it can become an interesting history of your prayer life. Did, did any of you have parents that had you do a prayer journal? I know. I just I just heard somebody talk about this, and I I had never heard of it before. But they, it was an adult who told me that they just went back and found they were cleaning out some stuff, and they found their teenage prayer journal, and their parents had made them write down in a spiral notebook everything, everything just write down the things that you want to pray about, and it was perfectly private. It wasn't you know uh, anything that they needed to share with anybody else. But they said how cool it was to go back and look at the things, you know, 20 years ago that they thought was important to pray about. Well, well, I don't think you'd bother to keep 20 years worth of, of prayer in your logos. It would be interesting to go back six months and say, look at what I was concerned about six months ago. And now look at um, So from that standpoint, having a log like this that you can actually go back through and maybe on those down days where you're thinking, you know, prayers don't get answered, you can go back through and look at all the sick people that you prayed for that got better or the situations that occurred that resolved themselves and all those things. It's a powerful way to help you understand how much God really is working and active. <coughs> Questions about that? Okay. Next on the homepage is my library. This 
the section of your home page that's important. If you purchased a scholar's library, I forget how many books you have, uh, but I think it's somewhere near 400 books. How many of you have started a paper library with real, I mean, with real books? I mean, how many of you know every book that you have? Really? You, I mean, every one of them. You, Okay, it's only like five or six Because I, you know, I turn around and I've got one of those, you know, walls of books, and I turn around and go, do I have that book? I, I think I have that book. Do I, I'm not sure if I have that book. Well, now hide them in your computer. I have 2,000 books in my library, my electronic library. I forget that I have books that will help me do particular studies. What my library does is it helps remind you. And the cool thing is that it gives you a book of the day. What it does is it shows you the cover of the, the paperback book or the paper book, gives you the title, and then it gives you a synopsis of what that book is about. Get in the habit initially of just looking at this once a day. I mean, how long does it take for you to read this little synopsis and say, oh, I've got a book that will help me do that, okay? Make little notes if you need to. But it's really easy to lose your electronic books because you forget that you have them. Now, if you customize this view again, if you just click Customize and go down to Library, you've got a few choices. You've got Book of the Day, Study Tools, and Library. Uh, make sure all of those are chosen. Let's save changes. So now it should look like this. And what you have is you have one book, your book of the day. Then you have study tools, which is our access points to your library. It's also, they, they help you out by saying, unlock new titles for my library. What's that? Buy more books. Okay, that's their way of saying, you want to unlock new books. You've got 700 that you don't know you have, but you need more. Um, so that's a way to purchase new books. But then this other one with this library, you'll notice that it's cycling. It's going through about every 15 or 20 seconds and showing you a different book in your library. And if you stop and click on it, it's going to open that particular book and show you what that book is about. It's going to open into the cover page. So if you see a book that you're interested in that you didn't know that you had, uh, and you want to read the, int the introduction to it or you want to just look at the synopsis in the front of the book or whatever, you can click on it and find out more about the books that you now own. <laughs> Again, folks, one of the problems is we get in the habit of using four or five tools all the time and we forget that we got 250 other ones that might be able to help us with our study. Okay, So that's my library. If you want to get a sense of your library, hold down the control key and hit L. You should get a screen, a, a window that's called My Library. Is that what everybody got? You'll notice that you have collections at the top. And the first one is, the one mine is set on is All Unlocked Resources. You have all known resources and all locked resources. Leave it just on all unlocked resources for right now. And just grab the cursor over here and just scroll through your library. <coughs> now, if these books are not grayed out, they're all books you own and you've got unlocked and they're available for you right now. Now, you'll notice that I'm still scrolling. <coughs> and I can do this for about 10 minutes. So it's really easy for you to get sidetracked and, and forget that you have resources. Make yourself use this little My Library tool on your home page, or at least get in the habit of doing Control-L and exploring that list frequently, especially while you're learning. Get familiar with what books you own and what books are on your shelf. Any questions about how My Library works?
Now, that's also one of the deeper core texts that I want you to write down is Control-L. Control-L opens the My Library window. Yes, Larry? Is there any way you can find out, like, the total number before it came out? Uh, yes, but not from there. Uh, and it takes a while, so I don't want to run it right now. But remind me, and I'll show you how to do that after, after class or during the break. Um, so remember Control-L, because anytime you want to open a book, for example, I'm at my home page, but Danny earlier in exegesis class, he mentioned Origin. The guy's name was Origin, right? Well, I know that I have the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church in my library. So real quick, I'm just going to do, I'm going to do Control L. I'm going to type, start to type, Oxford. It's going to pull it right up. I'm going to click on having opened it, and then I'm going to type in Origin. There's an article on Origin. It was born in, in around 185, died in 254, and gives me all this information about Origin. Okay? Now, how long did that take me? <laughs> Is that ridiculous or what? <coughs> now, some of you may have had questions in your library research assignment last quarter about things like, who was John Chrysostom, right? How long did it take you to find that answer? How about that fast? All I did was type it in. Now, what do I have to know to do that? Now, last quarter, I tried to teach you, and tried is the optimum phrase there, the importance of certain kinds of books. It's great to know that I can open Oxford and find John Chrysostom that fast. And by the way, in the third edition of Oxford's, the article is on page 345 if you care. <coughs> but you have to know what books to go look at. Now, there are ways to just type in John Chrysostom, and we're going to look at that later on today, and find this information. But when you do know what books you have, and you know what the purpose of those books are, then getting right to information takes no time at all. It's, uh, it's, it's very quick. I was telling Denny, uh, he was mentioning in, um, well... Yeah, we'll do that later. He was mentioning a particular passage, two unique words in exegesis in a particular passage. Well, I was, while he was doing that, and while I was taking my notes, I wasn't just fooling around, <laughs> I happened to determine that both of those words only occur in that passage in 1 Peter. They don't show up anywhere else in the New Testament. Now, that's an interesting little factoid that, especially if you're preaching that particular passage, may come in very handy. Those, I mean, Peter used two very unique words in that situation. As a matter of fact, they're so unique that they don't occur anywhere else in the New Testament. You think he chose that word carefully, or at least the Holy Spirit through Peter chose that word very carefully? So it's little bits of information like that that can be very, very powerful in your study. Okay, I digress. Next is news. And a lot of the news is very similar to the latest news. And there is a difference, um, but I'll be honest with you, I don't ever remember what it is. And I, I've, I found the answer on their website once on what the difference between news and latest news is. Um, I don't recall. It seems to me, if I remember correctly, that once you click on one, it disappears from latest news and just stays in news. Um, kind of like a, a news service does, where if you read the article, it doesn't show up anymore. Uh, but latest news or news, they both give you basically the same bit of information. <coughs> and the last section is blogs. There are two blogs that um, you can subscribe to right here from your home page. And if you, again, go back to customize view, I know we keep going there, but I want you to get in the habit of how to customize this stuff. There's two particular ones. One is the Logos blog, and the other one is by a man named Morris Proctor. And it's Morris Proctor's Tips and Tricks. If you don't subscribe to anything else, subscribe to Morris Proctor's Tips and Tricks. Morris Proctor 
is the only authorized Logos trainer in the country. He goes everywhere and does seminars. And I've actually taken his seminar. It's a two-day deal. It's excellent. It's very good. And when you find yourself uh, out in full-time ministry and you don't have access to a class like this, if he's coming through town, I recommend that you take the class unless you've you've really stayed diligent with your use of Libronics and have have you know kind of mastered it to some level. It's a very good seminar. I mean, at the time that I took it, I considered myself more of an advanced user than a basic user, and I still learn things, little little tiny things. But his tips and tricks um, are are really helpful. He'll talk about keyboard shortcuts or how to change the size of a font or uh, how to run a particular report with just a, a keyboard shortcut or something along those lines. So they're little tidbits that will help make your use of, of Libronics more efficient over time. There are a couple of other blogs. If you're, if you're into blog reading software, RSS feeds, and all that kind of stuff, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that today. Uh, but you can subscribe to a couple of Logos employee blog sites. You can find them on the Logos website. Uh, and they, are, they tend to be excellent. They tend to be a little bit more upper end. Uh, original language study stuff, syntactical stuff, that kind of thing. So um, it, it kind of goes from there. So that's basically your home page. But you see how much information you have just in this one little window. We haven't even started yet. Questions about how to customize the home page, how to do any of that kind of stuff. Okay, we're good? All right. Go to the Bible study starter. And make sure that that is the window that is is expanded. This is where you begin to use the software. You have three choices. You have study passage, study word, and study topic. And then you'll also notice down here that you have Bible reading. This is really neat. And if you teach Bible classes... This is really cool. You can create custom Bible reading plans. Anybody ever do the read through the Bible in a year thing? I mean, they make whole books on giving you calendars of all that kind of stuff. Well, what if you wanted to read through the Gospel of John in the next nine weeks? And some of you might need to do that because you're taking John class, right? Um, click on Create a Bible Reading Plan. Now, how, how many of you are taking John? Just a couple. Uh, what other textual classes do you guys have this quarter? Acts. Acts. Uh, okay, so you've got Acts 1 and 2. So you need to read through the whole book of Acts in the next 10 weeks. Right? So let's do Acts. So the name of the Bible reading plan, I'm just going to call it Acts Reading. The passage, instead of Genesis and Revelation, just type in the word Acts. And you can just select these and change them. Now you'll notice that when I typed in Acts and went to, clicked in the next area, it changed my presets to special. Whenever you type in a single book in most of these uh, dialog boxes, it's going to change the presets to special. But click on the, that box and you'll see that you have preset things that you could read. Just the Old Testament, just the New Testament, Old and New Testaments, each session. So you can tell it that you want to read an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage every day that you do your reading. Do you follow that? So you don't just start in Genesis 1 and try to get all the way through. Each day you're reading from Old and New Testament. Or Old and New Testament Psalms and Proverbs each each session, or vice versa. But for this se session, we just want Acts. You can choose the version. Those of you that like your New King James, you can select New King James here because it's not going to matter. And then what days do you want to read? Do you want to read every day? Do you want to just read weekdays? Do you want to just do the weekends? Whatever. You can click these little boxes and it will allow you to change that. Um, my start date is today, November 20th, or 27th. When is the end of the quarter? Well, it's about January 31st, I think. 
It's probably January 30th. So for the sake of argument, the end date, click on January 30th. And now say OK. It'll take a minute. And there is your reading. Today, you need to read Acts 1, 1 and 2. pick up my end date. Did everybody get a diff- get the right end date? Okay. I'm going to close this for a second and do a new one. If you need to change it, you can just click on properties. Yeah, see, mine said January 30th, 2009 was my problem. So that's no wonder it only needed to it. No wonder it only needed two verses a day, because we're going to be reading it for the next two and a half years. You can just delete it and change it. Yeah, reading for that class is going to be pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah, now see, I typed in 2007, because so, I'm going to read till January 30th of 2007, right? <coughs> Notice it won't let me do that because I can't read back in history. So, January 30th, 2008. Now say okay. Now I need to read the first 14 verses today. And you'll notice you've got a little status check mark. Don't click on that yet. But just now, just close this window. Just click the X in the corner. And you'll notice on your home page, it now shows you the reading that you have to do today. Now, if I want to do this reading... I guess I could go find my Bible and open it up, but if I just click on what I need to read, I can hover over it and see it, or I can click on it, and it's going to open my Bible to that edition that I need to read. So there's what I need to read. And I can sit here and I can read the first 14 verses. And when I'm finished, I can click the little checkbox And it disappears and shows me what my next reading is going to be. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this is if you don't do your reading today, that's what is on your screen tomorrow. Both of them. And the next day, you have three of them. And it it piles up on you. Like, um, you said you were going to do this every day, and now you haven't done it in two weeks. Guess what? You're going to have a 14-day list of things that you should have been reading. But that's good. I mean, that's a reminder to you that you... Started out dedicated to doing this. Now you don't want to do it. So, <laughs> just a little little checkbox right next to the title there. Just that little tiny checkbox next to it. When you click it, it'll disappear. Okay, it's. Uh, they, do they break it two or two fifteen? Two fifteen. Okay. I haven't done a Tuesday, Thursday class in a while, so uh, we still have a few minutes. But that's really cool. Now, the neat part is, if you click on this little title, this Acts reading, you can actually select all of this and copy and paste it into a Word document and hand it out to your Bible class. Say you're teaching a Sunday morning Bible class on the Gospel of John and you can map out what they need to read every day during the quarter. Well, you can create a custom list like this, copy and paste it into a Word document, print it out and hand it out the first day of class and say, this is what you should be reading every night or every morning to get through the Gospel of John and the amount of time that we're going to deal with. That's a great tool for your students. Now, if anybody's ever tried to do that manually and figure out how many verses there are and divide it by the number of days, and then it's, I mean, it's... It just takes time. It's not impossible. But again, that's what these kinds of things do for you, is they allow you to do things quickly that used to take at least an hour or two. Well, we just did it in 15 seconds. And if you have multiple classes, those of you that are students, I strongly recommend that you, you map out what book or books you need to read this quarter. How many of you have Dave's OT5? Does anybody in here have OT5? 
So you've got you've got some serious reading to do this quarter um, in OT5. Map it out, and it'll tell you how much of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel you need to read each day. Yeah. Yes, you can change all of those parameters. If you click on properties, you can say, I just want to read once a week and on Sunday. Okay? The other thing that you can do is you can forget the dates and you can say, I want to read every day for the next 10 weeks. I don't care what the dates are. Or I want to read for the next 15 sessions. I don't care what the dates are. And you can generate them wherever you want. Now, notice this last little option, which is nice. Prefer to end readings at a pericope boundary or a chapter boundary. It's smart enough to not leave you in the middle of a pericope if you have one of those selected. So your Bible reading for the day isn't going to get you halfway through the story of Zacchaeus. It's going to get you all the way through to the end of that particular story and stop, which is kind of cool. I mean, I mean, it's a neat way to not leave you in the middle of a context at each day's reading. Now, to date, you can't create um, reading plans for other electronic books that I know of. Uh, that's something that I've asked them to do, and I hope that someday they do it, where you're reading Geisler and Nix for a class. Those of you, how many of you have How We Got the Bible? You have Geisler and Nix in your electronic version. I don't know if you know that or not, but you should have it in your Libronics. Um, <laughs> for that particular class, there's advantages to having the paper book because Warren wants you to take notes in the paper book. But it would be cool to say, okay, I need to read the first ten chapters of Guys Learn Next by next Friday. You know, give me a reading plan to help me do that. Uh, you can't do it. It's, it's strictly Bible reading at this point, but hopefully they'll add that capability next time. Questions about Bible reading plans? Isn't that neat, though? I, I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of the read through the Bible in a year thing. Because sometimes it gets people off track. It, it's more They're more interested in getting through it than learning what it's talking about. But hey, if it gets members to read, you know, it I, it would be cool to have your members say, everybody read through, you know, the Gospel of John during this class. And so giving them the tools to do that uh, can be very helpful. Questions about that? Can you, can you mark one red and you wanted to change it back where you made a mistake? Can you do that? Um, you can click, um, let's see, hide red passages. That's a good question. I don't know how you bring one back if you if you've marked it. Um, I'll see if I can find that out. I'll have to look. I don't know of a way to bring it back if you've marked it off. Now, what I've done in the past is delete the reading list and recreate it. Um, if it you just flip around just now and clicked on it, but it's one you really wanted to leave in there. Uh, you can just recreate the list. I will warn you in advance that somewhere in this quarter, like maybe on a midterm test, you may need to create a Bible reading plan for a particular class. Uh, and so you might want to just make sure that you understand how to do this because uh, you may see it again. Questions? Okay, Bible study starter. When I had you turn on study options, you don't have to do this right now, but I'll, I'll turn mine off so that you can see the difference. Under passage study, that show study options, when we turn that on, if it's off, you'll notice that you only have the choice of study passage, study word, and study topic. Now, those are cool, but under study passage, you really need these other study options. So if they ever disappear, that's why. Is that the show study options checkbox under passage study has been turned off. 
The reason that you need them is that it gives you these four options under study passage that are very, very powerful. Now, we talked earlier about studying John 3.16. Select Bible only and type in John 3.16. Now, I need to tell you, how do you type in John 3.16? Any way you want. This software is very smart as far as different ways for you to butcher abbreviations for the Bible. <laughs> you can type J-O-H, you can type J-O, you can, I mean, sometimes it may think it's Jonah versus John, but for the most part, you can really butcher how you start to type it in. You don't have to put colons between the, the chapter and the verse. You can use a, a period, you can use a space, I can type J-O-H space 3 space 16. It's going to do the same thing. It's, it's very good at picking up what you're after. Now, before you click on anything, you'll know that it, it's asking me what I want to study. I typed in John 3.16. So it's saying, do you want just a verse? Or do you want these pericopes in which the verse occurs? Uh, For God so loved the world, 16 to 21, and so on. Um, now, these are different periods based on different versions of your Bible. How many of you uh, study with multiple Bibles? Okay. When I ask this question again, everybody raise your hand. How many of you use multiple Bibles? Okay. You, you need to get in the habit of looking at multiple versions of, of this passage that you're studying, okay? It's really important not to get so locked into one. I mean, we talk about, you know, I hear preachers will say, I use the New American Standard because the one Moses brought down off the mountain, or it's the one that, you know, was inspired, or the New King James because of this, and blah, blah, blah. And that's great. You should have one that's your, kind of your go-to guy. But you need to get in the habit of looking at other, other versions. What these pericope lists are, are the pericope sets for other translations. Now, does anybody know what a pericope is? Mike? It's simply a, passage, a section of scripture. How long are pericopes? If, yeah, I mean... It, can it be one, I mean, you can call one verse a pericope, can't you? Um, it can be anything from one verse to the entire gospel of John. It can be your pericope, okay? It's just a fancy word that Danny will throw around a lot in exegesis, so I thought I might cover it ahead of time. Now, where is it getting these? Do you have pericope sets in your print Bible? Somebody open their Bible to John 3. 16. A print Bible. Miles, you seem to get there the fastest. Do you have a subhead somewhere on that page? What does it say? Look at my third one. The new birth. John 3, 1 through 21. Now turn to verse 21. Okay. You have a new pericope heading right after that, do you not? Yes. Yeah. See, all that is, is it's the subheadings out of your Bible. Now, you can turn on which ones of these you want and which ones you don't. I have all of mine turned on all the time. But if you're a New King James person, it's going to just show you the pericope headings from the New King James. If you're an NIV person, it's going to show you NIV. If you're a New American Standard, it's going to show you New American Standard. Okay? That's all that these are. But what it's saying is, did you really want to start in verse 16, or do you want to start at the beginning of the pericope, which is actually according... What version do you have? Okay. So do you want to start back in verse 1 to see the whole pericope? I just want the verse. So I can either click go or I can select John 3.16 and then hit go. But if I click go, it opens a Bible to John 3.16. Big surprise, Bible only opened one Bible, my preferred Bible. 
we'll take a break and then we'll explore these others. These others get very cool very fast. I don't know if that's just going to record through the break or not. Well, and I don't have any way to stop it and then restart it. So. Uh huh. Mike. I'm going to be the problem child. Yeah, you um, Okay. I don't know what's going on, but um, I, I'll. The only version that says that I have. Okay. I'll have to do it. Okay, well, first thing you have to do is you have to register because it has to go online and say what library do you own. Does this go? Uh, uh, that's Facebook. Uh, I mean, uh, no, it'll do it. It'll do it itself. Yeah, it'll, it'll go online. What is Joe Unlock a book directly from Logos. Call them first and find out if you get a discount. 
If it's one of their books, you can get a 50% discount. So there's no reason to pay full price. Now, Oxford's is a third party, so you don't get 50%, but I think we get 25%. So it's worth the 25 and 100 I got it at ninety nine ninety five. Yeah. So I call them. Yeah, you just gotta call them and say, I'm part of the academic program at Bear Valley and I want to buy Oxford's and they'll they'll hook you up. Okay. And um, look up me they'll uh, you can get electronically or they'll send you a CD. They'll probably send you a CD on some of those. Some of them they'll just make it available and when you do update it'll download. Uh, but some of them they have to send you a, a disc. But some of them are. But I just ordered uh, stuff yesterday from them, and I got it today. I mean, they're they're quick. Jr., how many stickers are you gonna put on that laptop? You even got your logo sticker right in the middle, right where it belongs. Cool. Um, do we have to have photos here, like maps? Or there are some maps. I'll show you that. There are, um, one of the cool add-ons that you can get to is Bible, Biblical Archaeological Review, the magazine. They have a, a two-CD set of archaeological photographs that are topically indexed. And so when you do a topic study for Jerusalem, it'll bring in those pictures of Jerusalem, uh, which would be pretty cool. I haven't ever gone that route, but... But yeah, there's... And just cruise through your uh, my library. Go to Control L, and then under Subject, just type Maps, and you'll see your map set. Um, when you unlock a book, that doesn't automatically tell you that you're going to find it. Right, so so if you unlock it, you uh, you bought it. Well, I mean, it wouldn't let you unlock it if you didn't buy it. I mean, you had to give them a credit card number or something. Yeah, you did. That's how that unlock this dictionary. No, if it's open, you didn't, unless you just told, no, that's just Webster's Dictionary, that comes with everything. So yeah, you didn't have to unlock that. Okay. I thought I Well, yeah, it's um, yeah, online, but I don't know. Uh, okay, that's <laughs> from the yeah, software. What yeah. Isn't that cool if the If you don't pay, they're just going to take your new car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And now, go through new use. Uh, okay. All my phones are locked. Okay, huh? and I've already oh, my done this and did this. So Oxford is not available. So the email address is already registered. So it's saying you're you already did you already start this process? The only time I ever gave them my was when I ordered it. Maybe no, that wouldn't. Is all correct? Yeah. after school, if you can, just call their phone number uh, on the website and, okay. and tell them what's going on and they'll just walk you through fixing it. I mean, it'll only take a little bit or so. Okay. No, that doesn't help you for class, but. <coughs> well, if we can do it real quick, let me look this stuff out right now. Take your laptop with you. Yeah, I mean, we're going to need it, right, for the rest of the Yeah, I mean, we're, we're playing with it, so if you can get it started, that would be better.
say if there's a way to Wait, my subject? Type map. Does your map say? Expand out this No, she's not. She wouldn't be able to go to
Okay, so basically with Bible only selected and we typed in John 3.16, what happened? The Bible only opened, right? <laughs> um, it's kind of a little weird. Now, what Bible opened? Why did the New American Standard 95 update open? Because that is the one that Moses brought down off the mountain. <laughs> but it's because you selected it as your primary tool, okay, your primary Bible. Now, that means that any time that Logos is going to pop open a window and show you the text, it's going to be the NAS 95 update. So... If you want to change that, if you are a new American, if you are a New King James person, um, or an ASV person, or whatever you know is the Bible you like, you can change that. Now I'm going to show you later that Logos has done something interesting with the NAS, the King James, and the ESV only. So there are capabilities within those three versions that you don't have in the New King James because they didn't build it in. So that's the reason I'm having you use the NAS 95 update right now, is because when we get to doing some things, there are some reports and stuff you can generate from those versions that you can't run from just any version. So we'll deal with that when we come to it. So close all and open home, that little, that little icon, that's the little house with the little piece of paper with the arrow, so it closes everything and reopens your home page. And change to Bible and commentary. And again, just type in John 3.16. And play around with how you type in John 3.16. I mean, don't just type John space 3 colon 16. I mean, play with some different ways that you do that. Especially when you start to get into your long books. I mean, don't type in 1 Corinthians space, you know, I mean, just one CO, one COR, one space CO, space COR. There's a lot of different ways you can get there. Okay. Now, it opened my Bible and my commentary. Big surprise. That's the, what I asked it to do. Now, one of the things that I want you to look at while this is open is in the heading menu for your your Bible. Do you see this menu right across the top here? It's showing you what passage you're on. It's showing you John 3.16. Also about halfway over in the middle, there's a little chain link, and it has an A next to it. And your commentary should have the same chain link and the same A, does it not? Okay. Scroll either window. Just push the arrows. What's happening? Your Bible and your commentary are linked together. That's what that little chain link is about. So if you move your Bible to a different passage, your commentary goes to that same passage. You don't have to change them twice. Up where you input um, the, the text, you know, we were at John 3.16, just type James 1, verse 2, and hit enter. And you'll notice your Bible jumped to James 1, 2. Your commentary jumped to James 1, 2. Okay? Now, type Genesis 1, 1. Your Bible jumps to Genesis 1, 1. What did your commentary do? Did your commentary go to Genesis 1 1? Okay, some did. Did your voice? Yours didn't? No, because I've got the bigger Genesis. If you chose a commentary set that does not have an Old Testament equivalent, it stayed at James 1 verse 2 because it doesn't know where to go from there. So that's what's going to happen as you start expanding your, your library. Now I'm going to show you how to make it jump to a specific commentary set 
later. We'll get into that. We can actually create relationships between, for example, I, I use an IVP uh, commentary sometimes. It doesn't have an Old Testament equivalent, but I like Kyle and Dalich as my Old Testament equivalent. Well, it won't automatically jump to that unless I set it up to do that, and I can set it up to do that. We'll deal with that later on in the quarter. So that's really cool. You can start to control which commentaries it jumps to. But it's neat that these windows are linked. That will become very important when we start to build our own workspaces. You can have workspaces with 50 windows open. I wouldn't uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but that are all linked to different things, where these five windows are linked together, and these three windows are linked together, and these seven windows are linked together. And whenever you move one, all of them in that set move with them. So it's nice that you don't have to key in where you want to go all over the place. Make sense? On the uh, commentary, mm -hmm. you know, it gives the verse, the section, um, 1 through 11. <coughs> um, when I scroll over that, it, it gives me uh, the Bible version, and down on the bottom it says American, New American Standard Bible, the 1995 updated. Is that because I have that open? Or? We're going to expect that right now. Okay. In your, uh, go back to a New Testament passage. It'll be easier. Uh, let's go back to John 3.16, so we're all looking at the same thing. In your commentary, you're going to notice some blue words. Usually they're verses, um, they're links. Or s find any blue word or number and just hover your mouse over it. Don't click anything, just point at it. This is now... The coolest feature in this software. Uh, what this is doing is it's actually looking up the reference for you and showing it to you in a window. Now, what's it showing you? It's showing you your NAS 95 because you've told that told it that that's your preferred Bible. But you don't have to click on it to see it. You just have to hover over these hot spots, and it's going to show you what the text is. Now, how many of you did any remember looking in Art and Gingrich or uh, in library research last quarter? How many passages were there listed in Art and Gingrich? Just trying to look up all the cross references would take you 30 minutes. Well, now you can hover your Bible, your cursor over each one of those, and it's going to open it and show it to you. I'll show you more about that later including Josephus and Philo and all those, if you ha happen to have them in your library. So it's very cool. But that's what's happening here is you're just seeing, whenever you see blue words and you hover over them, it's going to pop open a window that's going to show you what that verse says in your NAS. You'll also notice occasionally these little footnotes. They're usually red, highlighted superscript or subscript numbers, depending on the resource. I've got a footnote right here, and when I hover over it, it tells me what page in, jo in John's Wisdom by Witherington uh, that came from. So you can follow uh, passages that way, cross-references. So pretty straightforward when you tell it to open your Bible and open the commentary. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is since we went to John 3.16, in verse 16... For God so loved the world, you notice that loved has a footnote, right? It's got a little A. Does everybody have that? When you hover over the A, what does it show you? It shows you all your cross-references, right? Now, try to click on robot A. <laughs> it doesn't work because as soon as you move off of the little cross-reference letter, it closes the box. Click once on the little A. Now you can go to all of those cross-references. Now, again, I mean, just think about using your paper Bible. You've got a whole column full of cross-references. If you happen to not know 
what Romans 5.8 says. Here, all you have to do is hover over it, and it opens it right to it. The cool part is you haven't left the verse that you're studying. Now, with, with them blue, where you can highlight them, click on Romans 5.8. What happens? Everything jumps to Romans 5.8, right? Your Bible jumped to 5.8, and your commentary did too, because those windows are linked together. You can go back. By hitting these back up and down buttons and previous buttons. At the top, see the arrow that points up to previous? That's going to get you to the previous chapter. The back button is going to get you back to the previous verse. So back and forward is just like a web browser. When you hit back on a website, it takes you to the previous page you visited, right? Well, back and forward in these menus works the same way a web browser does. It will jump multiple books. The previous and next jumps to the top of the pericope or to the beginning of the next pericope. Okay? It takes you into those contexts. So just remember that previous and next are about moving through where you are. Back and forward are about where you've been. Does that make sense? All right, you ready to have some real fun? Close all and open home. So we've done Bible only. We've done Bible and commentary. Click on passage guide. Skip exegetical guide for a second. And type in John 3, 16. And hit go. Now, depending on your computer... And how fast it is, this may take a minute or two. Um, but what it does is it opened your NAS 95 update, and it's also in this thing that's called a passage guide. Basically, what it's doing right now is it is going through your entire electronic library and finding every reference to John 3.16. What did I miss? Did they get it? Um, I, I think so. Okay. Now, we went to the home page, and under study passage, we typed in John 3.16, and we had it set to passage tied. So it ran this giant report. Basically, the way I one of the articles I read from a guy that was a new Logos user said, when I bought Logos, it's like they backed up an entire truck full of books to my office and unloaded them, and then a librarian came out afterwards. And that's really what this is like. What you just did was you asked your electronic librarian while I'm working on something, I want you to put a bookmark in every book on my bookshelf to John 3.16. Just in case I want to go look at it, I want to know every book that contains John 3.16. Well, they're all right there. That's fast. I mean, just think of how long... It, I mean, the days of uh, books that up on your desk this high, in some ways, are over. I mean, you don't have to do that anymore. And little index cards and pieces of paper marking pages and all that kind of stuff. It's all right here. Now, sad part is, what is the very first section that it gives you? I wish you could change the order of these, because I would really like commentaries to be like the bottom. Um, but, when you run a passage guide, the first thing it deals with is commentaries. Now, I want, to, I want you to notice that right next to these titles, there's a little box that has a minus sign if you click on it, it compresses that menu and turns into a plus sign. So I can actually collapse all of these menus if I want to or expand them. Okay, that's what that little plus and minus does is it expands or contracts that particular menu. But click on any one of those commentaries. John 3.16. 
Click on another one. John 3.16. Now the cool part, one of the things that it's doing that I like when you're dealing with this is it's closing one and opening another. You're not, you're not keeping all of them open all the time, which has its problems. Sometimes you want more than one open. I'll show you how to do that later. But otherwise, what happens is you end up clicking on a bunch of stuff, and the next thing you know, you got 20 resources open, and you're wondering why Libronix is taking a long time to think through questions you're asking it. <coughs> well, it's because it's trying to manage 20 open resources. So the first one is commentaries, and you have dozens of them. You'll even notice, yes, Terry? The list that we see is what in our library. Yes, it's what you own. Now, you'll notice that at the bottom of that list is a little a link that says more with an arrow. Click on that for just a second. At the bottom of the list, it says more. Sometimes you run these reports and it's like, oops, I really didn't mean to do that because it's going to take 10 minutes for it to finish. Um, but look at the list of books that you now have available, all of which are now open in John 316. All you have to do is click on them. One of the cool ones that I want you to notice is, um, and you should all have it as far as I know, about halfway, two-thirds of the way down the page, there's one that says, The New Manners and Customs of the Bible. That's actually pretty cool, because it's about some of the stuff that Denny was talking about today in exegesis class. What was the deal with the clothing at the wedding? Well, he was given clothing, right? So those kinds of customs, this book can help you determine some of those manners and customs of the time. And it's a versified book, okay? So this is a good opportunity to talk about different kinds of books. When, when I say that a book is versified, <coughs> it means that it's searchable from a Bible verse, a chapter and verse. You'll notice that when you open the New Manners and Customs, look at the little uh, the dialogue box at the upper left-hand corner. What does it say? John 3.16, or I've actually scrolled mine to 3.29 for some reason. Um, but you can see that it, it actually, you can type in a passage. If that passage is in that book, it'll open to that passage. So it's versified. If you go to a Bible passage, it's going to open to that Bible passage. Now, two boxes over, there's a thing that looks like a little piece of paper. And if you hover over it, it says Active Index. Click on that you'll notice that there are three possible active indexes for this book. Page number. So if you know the page number that you want to look up in this book, you can just type it in. Bible, which is the Bible verse that you want to go to. Or topic. So this particular book is searchable in three ways. You can search by topic or you can search by Bible passage. We'll talk more about active indexes when we start customizing workspaces and that kind of stuff. But I just want you to understand that some books, since they're versified, will jump, even though they're not Bibles or technical commentaries. Does that make sense? So you now have this giant list of things that are open to John 3.16. The second category in the passage guide is cross-references. Has anybody ever heard of the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge? Denny's going, absolutely. Click on the treasury, either one, but click on the second one, the treasury of scripture knowledge, not the new treasury of scripture knowledge. Look at what it is. It is a book of cross-references. Now, this is actually a print book. I think we have one in the library. I'm pretty sure we do. So you're looking up John 3.16, and you'll notice it's got cross-references for God. It's got cross-references for gay. It's got cross-references for whosoever. <coughs> How long would it take you to look up all of those references? Well, just hover. There's each one, one at a time. 
It's all right there. This makes cross-referencing so much faster because you actually have the text right there without ever leaving the book. No oohs and ahs? That's cool. I now expect oohs and ahs after the last one. So you've got cross-references that you can actually follow and work with. Biblical people came up none. Um, we're, I want to show you biblical people in a minute because it's way cool. But John 3.16, it shows none, but why? There are no names in John 3.16. There's no personal pronouns, uh, proper names in John 3.16. There are personal pronouns, but not proper nouns. Okay. Literary typing. This talks about genre as, as Danny talked about in exegesis. It's genre is the way you pronounce it. But it's talking about gospel narrative. okay? And you can actually uh, follow the links to John. But this is using Mackey's literary genre coding of the New Testament. This is just going to give you an indication of your passage falls into a pericope that is particular genre. If you go to uh, poetic work, it'll talk about poetic or, or apocalyptic or a gospel or an epistle or poetry or history. So, it, again, it's trying to help you do exegesis. It's trying to help you recognize what type of language am I looking at in this verse. Is it a narrative? Is it apocalyptic? What am I, what am I looking at? Parallel passages. There are a number of books in your library. Harmony of the Gospels by Robertson. Uh, Records of the Life of Jesus by Shaman. Um, there's Synopsis of the Four Gospels by Alan. Or is it Alon? Is it Alon? Nestle Alon? Okay. I never know how to pronounce it. Um, but it shows you where you can find uh, parallel passages. If you click on one, it opens these parallel passages. Now, what I find interesting is that it, it tells you that there's parallel passages even when there are uh, So it uses this, but you'll notice these are all listing basically your passage or pericopes that your passage is contained in. Uh, so it's not showing you that there are parallels. In essence, it's telling you that there aren't any. But you'd have to click on them to see that there aren't. So when we hit one that does have parallels, it'll list them all out. And I'll show you more about that parallel passage report in just a little bit. Important word. Okay, what are the important words in this passage? I need to give you um, a caveat here. I have yet to have them be able to explain to me how they generate this report. I'm hoping that someday somebody on the tech side is going to tell me what kind of program they use to generate this. So... I don't trust it to tell me what the important words are because I don't know how it's created. How is it determining whether a word is important or not? It's interesting. It's an interesting report. You'll notice that it tells you begotten, loved, only, perish, whosoever. Um, but And the, diff the relative size of the words is supposed to be cluing you in on how important the word is. So if the word is larger, the word is more important. Again, if I had some idea of how they're choosing these words, I'd put more faith maybe in this report, but I don't. So it's nice to know that it's there. It's a great place to start your study. But I wouldn't preach a whole sermon based on parish being the most important word here because the important words function in the passage guide told me that it's the most important word. Okay. 
Now, there is something really cool. We've only been dealing with English, right? We've, we've, we haven't started to even scratch the surface of, of Greek studies. But you'll notice that you have a choice of English or Greek. Click on Greek. It'll take a second to rerun that part of the, the report. And now you have the Greek words. Now, if you can read those, you're well off. Now, that's my issue with you not learning Greek, guys. There are a lot of reports within this software that's just going to give you a list of Greek words. Well, what are they? Now, there are ways to figure out what they are, but can you even read them? I mean, do you even know, um, you know what the word is? Can you even pronounce it? So y you need to pay attention in Greek class, and you need to learn your Greek. Okay. okay. Yes? Um, actually, I think it's simply a matter of space, and I'll show you. Um, see how it has this little ellipsis? It's telling you that there are more words, and if you actually drag your window wider or click on that ellipsis, it'll give you more. Uh, but it enlarges the words that are important, but you're right. It, apparently, it only found four important Greek words. That is interesting. But that little ellipsis gives you the whole passage, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. So, again, I asked three or four people at Libronics to explain to me how they generate that report, and they don't know. I mean, there's somebody there that does, but the guys that I've asked don't have any of this. So. Sentence diagrams, there are actually functions, and, and we aren't going to have time in the scope of this course to really go through this. Um, but you're going to ha have um, the ability to diagram sentences. Now, how many of you like diagramming sentences? Yeah, good. There's tools that will let you do it, and they're really powerful. And I noticed, I noticed Danny back there kind of went, like, I don't want anybody to know that I like to diagram sentences. <laughs> He's a closet diagrammer. <laughs> but it is very cool. I mean, if, when you really start to break down the text, uh, again, talking about exegetical work, and you really want to dissect the passage, breaking it down into a diagram can be very, very helpful. Now, there are also people all over the country that are doing this, and there are places online where you can download their sentence diagrams. Um, now, if you don't understand diagramming, I wouldn't just go randomly downloading everybody's sentence diagrams and saying, oh, this guy must know what he's talking about. It could be, you know some of you who has no idea how to diagram a sentence, but um, just know there are tools that will allow you to do that. We'll, I'll show you where the tools are, but we're not going to get into actually doing a sentence diagram in this class. Why do we show none? Pardon? Why do we show none there? Because there aren't any. You haven't created any. Uh, diagramming is a manual process. It's not, you can't just pick a passage and say diagram it for me. It's got the tools for you to draw the diagram yourself, but you have to do that and then save it. And then if you did, it would show up there. Um, compare versions. This little chart uh, is beyond the scope of my understanding. <coughs> Here's what it's telling us. It's telling us the further apart these little squares are, the more diverse the translation is. Um, but it's visually it doesn't make much sense to me. There are reports where you can compare versions where you can see highlighted words, and to me that makes more sense. Um, if you want, notice that it says click on a Bible, a Bible abbreviation to generate a word-for-word -word comparison. Click on the ESV. Now, yours is going to look different than mine because I've been messing with mine. But what it does is it runs – this report I can make sense out of. The little visual with the little squares all over the box I, uh, doesn't help me out a whole lot. My base version is the ESV. Why? 
Because that's the one you clicked on. So you're saying, I want you to compare everything else against the ESV. The next one shows you that the New American Standard has a 7.7% variant from the base. Now, essentially, all that means is that it looks like three words basically are in a different place than they are in the ESV. Compared to the King James, which has a 15% variant. And you can see all the highlighted words and how they're different. So this starts to show you word for word how one passage compares to another. You, yeah. Is this, is this trying to tell us that the blue are the ones that are added and the pink are the ones that are blue? Yes. Blue have been completely added. Pink have just been moved to a different position. They're still contained in the original, but they're not in the exact same spot. The blue ones are really the most significant words. Those are the words that are actually totally different from your base. Okay? So, becomes very powerful, though. Remember earlier when I asked how many of you use different versions when you study your Bible? <laughs> Everybody. Okay. Um, here's, here's a great place to start. You don't necessarily have to, to cycle through all your Bibles, run a passage guide, and look at your parallel passages, and it will give you that in a visual way. In that little diagram, the parallel versions thing, since it's two-dimensional, it shows us they're far apart this way, and it shows their differences in the vertical as well. Does that mean anything? See, that's what I can't get my hand around. I can understand why one would be far away, but why is one way off to the left and one's way off to the right? And, and I, I don't understand. I, I, I really don't. And so the easiest thing I can tell you is this software is so deep that it's just not to get. But there are other reports that are clearer to you. Uh, so that's why I just click on this one and run this this report to, to see it. Um, with this comparison, there are, I mean, there are only six versions of my I'd like to look at the NIV if I was going to compare to something. Why is there a particular reason it didn't show up? Is it the same, or can I choose to have that default? Click up here where it says versions, and now you can choose versions. And you're going to get a little dialog box, and it's going to show you what versions you want. And you can have it map everything in the world. Now. Those of you that aren't there yet, but since we have one in the back of the room that enjoys this very much, you can actually map groups in here as well, Denny, so that you can compare um, Textus Receptus to U UBS or, you know, whatever you wanted. Uh, now, we started with an English translation, so I wouldn't do it from here, but you can uh, if you start with a Greek text. So, interesting that you can actually compare Greek texts. Um, so there's your answer, Brett. You can change this to whatever you want. Where do you get the top under uh, versions in the report. Do you have it? Right here. So, you can, again, you can customize this report. Now, I want to make sure that we understand what we're seeing. Because the King James Version is 15.4% different from the ESV, the King James is bad, right? No. See, none of this is evaluating, none of this is evaluating the quality of the translation. Hello. 